We on? Good morning. Uh, pleasure to be here with uh, what I think is a great panel. So in the interest of time, I'm going to introduce everybody very quickly, actually just give you their name, and then they're going to tell you in like 15 seconds what their current job is and what they do, and then we're going to dive into the topic of the day, AI, in the drug discovery healthcare industry. So to my left, Jeb Radner, who is running R&D at Novartis, president of NIBR, a very big job. Next to him is Lee Lemon, uh, and I'm forgetting one part here, I'm sorry, Lee. Lee Lemon Becker, who is senior director of data science at Roche. Mark Merkel, who many of you may know locally, Mark was uh, uh, one of the pioneers in the rational drug design at Vertex, very well known, and now he's a founder and CSO of a Relay, which is another, guess what, rational drug design company. Uh, Georgia Papa Thomas, who is the global head of data analysis, data science at JNJ, and Eric Perksalis, who is the CSO of DataVent. So, Jay, I'll put you on the spot right away. Just give us in 15 seconds, what do you do today? What's your job? What is the scope of it? And, and then we'll move on to Lee. Thanks, JF. Um, so I'm Jay Bradner. I'm a chemical biologist and a cancer doctor, formerly of Partners Healthcare. Um, now president of the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research, um, which is um, where the innovative medicines of Novartis are invented and developed through phase one and two clinical trials. Lee? I'm Lee Lehman Becker. I'm with uh, Roche's Digital and Personalized Healthcare Partnering Unit, and I look for collaborators externally across our value chain, so beginning with discovery all the way through development and into the commercial setting. I should say that Lee was involved in the acquisition of Flatiron by Roche, which I'm sure many people here are interested to hear more about, so I'll be squeezing her a little bit, uh, quizzing her a little bit on that. And Mark? So I'm a physical organic chemist by training. I've been in pharma for a little more than 30 years and basically just try to bring new technology to make drug discovery a little faster, most recently at Relay, but I've helped to start a number of other companies in the area too. Georgia? Um, I'm uh, currently the global head of data sciences for J&J. I was the CIO of Janssen, the pharmaceutical companies of J&J uh, for the last seven years. I'm an engineer by training. My PhD is in mathematical modeling. I started my career at Bell Labs when uh, we were developing models and theories for AI, but we didn't have the data or the computational power to actually prove it. And the time has come now. I think we're at an inflection point. Um, and uh, I'm trying to set up um, data sciences for all of J&J, from strategy to process and governance, as well as treating data as an asset, and applying it uh, in every single function across J&J, from R&D to finance and HR. Eric? Yeah, hi, I'm Eric Praxels. I'm the CSO at DataVan. I was a pharma person for about 16 years, a couple years at FDA as CIO, and first chief uh, data scientist at FDA, and then I've been helped stuff found the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School, where I'm still part-time. Uh, Datavan is a, is a startup, and what we're really trying to do is link things together to solve bigger problems in medicine. A lot of folks have a lot of data. There's a very mature data market in healthcare. Most people get data as their effluent stream. It's not intentional, but we generate it as what we do. And so we're really trying to look at how do you really apply it at some of the, some of the problems that others might not want to take on. All right, great. So we're, now we're going to jump into the topic. Just as a very broad uh, statement, obviously we're all aware that there is an explosion of data in every sub-segment of our industry from discovery, research, development, healthcare management, uh, outcomes, real-world evidence, and so on. Uh, there is also an explosion of computing power and the sophistication of the tool is uh, growing rapidly. So obviously great opportunity. However, we're all aware that the a proverbial problem of uh, using computing tool, i.e. Uh, garbage in, garbage out, is not solved at all by AI. In fact, it's probably amplified. And so one of the goals we're going to try to achieve today is what are the areas, what are the applications or the sub-segments of AI and machine learning applied to healthcare, uh, which one are actually realistic and actually producing some tangible evidence uh, and generating excitement and validation for the entire field, and which one are actually still more aspirational and probably still more of a challenge today. So we're going to cover all the different segments uh, from discovery, 
uh, applied research, development, and then healthcare management, uh, maybe cost, maybe you know, outcome, real world evidence. Uh, we're going to start with Jay. Obviously, Jay is going to focus on discover research, guess what? And he's going to tell us where he feels that there is some tangible application today and where he feels that we're still a little, probably more at an inspirational stage. Okay, um, thanks, Jay. That's a tough one, eh? <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm happy to talk on this subject because it's quite uh, top of mind for us right now at Novartis as we're reimagining um, life sciences companies like ours um, as medicines companies powered by data and digital, uh, but also because the radical advances, perhaps driven by consumer applications of this critical vector of computer science, deep learning, have overt immediate and profound downstream relevance to drug hunting. Um, there is um, displacement of AlphaGo players and chess masters by AI, but I think it will be some time until we displace the discovery chemist. Rather, we imagine an augmented reality for the discovery chemist, where um, empowered by a legacy of data that a new chemist at Novartis wouldn't immediately download or have access to, um, inferences hard won into molecular recognition, into the biological behaviors of molecules, into the toxic features of chemical classes, um, enable fundamental decision making during the artisanal process of drug discovery and lead optimization. There is a lot of low hanging fruit, JF, but there's also a lot of hype right now. And so rather than buy into um, an inflated sense of um, optimism, we're looking at Novartis at the discrete contributions AI can make as catalysts, uh, driving effective molarity of data scientists and biological scientists or chemists to more efficiently, more expeditiously, but honestly more impactfully transition technologies from idea to prototype, from prototype to drug, from drug to important medicine. And there's numerous examples. Leveraging the, um, I think, consumer-driven application of image-based analysis and correlation that allows me not to get hit by a Tesla on my bicycle, um, we see an immediate opportunity to solve the molecular recognition problem. Mark, perhaps you'll talk more about that. Um, we see the potential to gain inferences in seven-day tox experiments that predict the outcome of very expensive 30 and 60 and 90 day tox experiments. In the fullness of time, we hope to connect the million patient records in our development organization with the real world experience of patients on our drugs and others with the 500 million discrete compounds at Novartis. This is an aspirational goal, but shy of typing a gene name in and having a perfectly fluorinated um, Lipinski compatible molecule exported, um, how can we leverage computational power and modern algorithms, the massive 50 petabytes of discovery data that we have to improve the everyday experience, almost invisible to the discovery scientists on their artisanal path of breakthrough medicine discovery. And there's many, I think, such opportunities. Okay, great. So, and I'll, I'll come back with some specific question and uh, touching on some of the points you've made. So, uh, Lee, I understand what you do is actually pretty broad scope, right? Because you're dealing with data all the way from discovery to you know, healthcare management. Uh, if I may, I'd love for you to maybe focus a little bit more on real world evidence, uh, you know, healthcare data in the context of your recent flat iron acquisition. Uh, you know, don't share anything you don't want to share, you can't, but I'm sure everybody would be interested to hear how it came about. What is the plan? You know, what was the vision? What, you know, what type of experience in the organization led you to believe that that could be a very valuable data set? So I'm sure everybody would be quite interested in that. Absolutely. Several years ago, we recognized the value of real world evidence and that treatment patterns actually were very different than what we were running in our traditional clinical trials. And we were seeking multiple partners at that point. So we had made an investment in Flatiron, We've made uh, recent collaborations with PSYAPs and recognizing that there was a wealth of data both at the clinical level, but also in connecting over to genomic data. And hopefully eventually tying things, for example, around 
patient reported outcomes and helping the patient and the doctor truly understand what's the best treatment for me. And something that uh, Dr. Abernathy spoke about yesterday that we're very, very excited about is the concept of real world control arms. So actually having a pairing of our clinical trials of something that's happening within the Flatiron network. And the ability to understand against true standard of care, the way it's actually being practiced in medicine out in the real setting versus breakthrough therapies. And I think that if you're moving into a paradigm where um, you know, we've had some low hanging fruit in the development world um, and it's getting more and more challenging that you really have to find those breakthrough drugs and demonstrate the value to the providers and to the payers of how they're actually gonna work for a patient. And we think that Flatiron is gonna allow us to do that. So. I have a question which I'm sure many people in the room has, which is, I would imagine that the challenge, the concept of uh, essentially a virtual control arm, uh, it's not virtual actually, but it's essentially a retrospective control arm where you would expect that the quality of the data is uh, so good or good enough that you can actually rely on that data set as a true comparable or control for a given experiment. How do you ensure, how do you do quality control on that, right? Because on the one hand, prospective clinical trials, we all know are very reductive, which is, you know, you, it's a very constraining environment. You know, everything has to be codified. The patient has to be, uh, you know, you have inclusion criteria. You, you have a number of people that are checking the quality of the data every day if it's done right. And it leads to a reductive environment, but at the same time, the whole point is accuracy. When you're buying EHR, and I'm stating the obvious, everybody have had that question, I'm curious practically when you make an investment like that, how do you do the quality control of the data set that is in there so that you get the comfort level that actually is those data set across several questions you could ask, not just a handful of questions, is going to be robust enough to give you that, the control, the statistical power to be a, a control. I think there's a few different uh, levels to the answer here. Uh, the first is that it's not just about retrospective data, that hopefully moving into a merging of retrospective and prospective data as we really start to do new untested things in this area around the virtual or real world trial. But one of the things that really attracted us to Flatiron among a lot of other potential partners is that they do have very sophisticated curation methodologies. And that is a mixture of both machine learning but also human curation by true experts. And these are people that can go into the unstructured data and really make sense around things like progression things that might be difficult for an untrained person to tease out without the clinical background. But it is that true uh, symbiosis between the machine learning and the human where they're continually informing each other and making sure that that quality is there, ultimately. We refer to that as uh, regulatory grade real world evidence. Okay, very good. Well, we probably will come back on that. I'm sure we'll have some questions. So Mark, now we're back to uh, Rational drug design and uh, your field that has been around for many years and uh, uh, tell us uh, what, what's going to happen next in the field. Yeah, I think the, um, um, the, the word that Jay used, artisanal, I think that's a good word because you know, drug discovery is a craft. And you know, when uh, I think a theme that you'll hear over and over on this panel is the idea that was just expressed about you know, very high quality data, well curated data, whether we're talking about clinical or research data. So I think the, one of the big challenges we have to be able to get better at drug discovery is to really think through how to represent the interactions that molecules are making, drug molecules are making with their, their protein targets, um, to understand that in a deeper way. And so that requires generating more data, but also more diverse kinds of information and thinking very carefully about how then all of that information can be put together, hopefully in a creative way, just to tease out that little bit of additional insight that then helps a drug discovery team to move a little faster. And the relevance of this would be, there are many targets that all of us know, if we could come up with a drug against those targets, we have a very high likelihood of helping patients, the so-called holy grail targets, which are historically called undruggable. We can debate whether that's a good or a bad word, but historically, there are many of these targets that have been very, very challenging or impossible. 
And so the question is, if you can use a, a richer data stream, a more diverse data stream, and couple that with simulation, and then apply artificial intelligence to that, will that enable you to gain that insight, which then helps the drug discovery team to crack that hard problem? And it's either to come up with a single lead molecule that maybe never existed before, or um, to help get around the, the downstream risks in drug discovery if you can find many different chemical approaches against that target. So now you have multiple ways to, to target um, the problem uh, by using these different chemotypes. And so even if one of those falls by the wayside because of some metabolic or, or tox problem, you have another one to come back to. So it's about gaining that insight that gives you more chemical matter that then you can apply to these very, very hard problems. Um, and there already, I think, is some evidence that this is starting to work. But I, I'm always, um, I, I'm a little bit baffled when I hear people talk about AI in the abstract, as if somehow the existing information we have with no curation or no new data being thought through carefully will somehow magically enable us to stamp our fingers and solve problems, because that, of course, isn't the reality. It's about thinking about how the AI can be brought to bear along with a very well thought through R&D strategy and the appropriate generation of new data and curation of that data to help you see the problem in new ways. And so it's challenging, but there already are lots of examples where it's beginning to work. So Mark, a follow-on question, and uh, particularly with regard to rational drug design, because I think there is some particularity about that particular field compared to, for example, the analysis of EHR data. The, the point is that the complexity of the data and yeah. the combinatorial possibility of, for example, molecular docking and you know, whichever biophysical interaction you're looking for, yeah. not to mention, of course, the uh, flexibility or variability of protein structure over time yeah. uh, is, uh, seems like a particularly good application, but also a particularly challenging application. What is the balance of power here between having more data so that you can actually train algorithm or you know, really induce machine learning and the balance of supercomputing, right? I would imagine that those are two things that are probably kind of meeting somewhere at a higher and higher level. But historically, the field has really been fed by the increased computing power mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe the rate of increase of the data because we don't have that many molecules that are actually proven drugs, yeah. at least in regard to the uh, magnitude of the human genome and other genomes. Mm -hmm. And so if you could talk a little bit about just supercomputing here, because it's an interesting example, particularly in that application, in that setup. Sure, sure. And so let's think about this in the context of how proteins actually function, because all proteins move in order to function. They're little machines, and we've all known that for 60 years. The concept of allosteria is not new, but it's historically been almost impossible to really understand with enough detail the nature of that protein motion. And so um, the company that I'm with now, Relay, one of our founders is David Shaw, who's basically designed supercomputers that are a thousand times faster at running molecular dynamics simulations. And so we have literally orders of magnitude more information to help us understand the motion of those proteins, but that in isolation is not sufficient because we also can tease much more information out of the structural biology. We can run uh, crystal structures at room temperature rather than at liquid nitrogen temperatures and see motion in those crystals. We can use NMR, we can use other biophysical techniques. And so the idea really is to think about how the simulation in combination with a very diverse set of experimental data, all aimed at understanding motion, whether you can then put that together in a way which helps you to learn something that you couldn't learn before. So the key is the combination of having much, much more computer power, but also having the appropriate experimental data to help guide the simulation and to help to interpret the simulation. Um, simulation by itself gives you ideas, but often is not accurate enough by itself to enable you to then draw a firm enough conclusion to guide a drug discovery team. So it's really the interplay of the experiment with the, the computation that provides more, um, more insight. Okay. So Georgia, um, 
what was striking to me as we prepared for the panel is in some ways the scope of your responsibility, right? The magnitude of the uh, data science efforts at GNJ throughout the entire organization. So rather than try to kind of box you into a couple, a couple of aspects here, I'd like maybe if you can describe a bit of the scope and then pick a couple of examples that are particularly exciting to you, maybe one being practical where you feel you're kind of there and maybe some that are much more aspirational and more strategic, and uh, so that we get a sense of the range of the things that you guys are working on. Yeah. So I, I think at J&J, we've come to realize that data science is just an inflection point. And um, because of the, all the other technologies that are becoming available. So I think we talk a lot about AI. We all know that we're really not implementing AI. It's mostly machine learning and deep learning. But it's all the other technologies that are coming in from cloud and high performance computing um, and all the sensors that gives us that um, um, richness of data. So at j, &J um, we really want to make the company more of an insights driven company. We've talked about being a science and technology. And uh, we're putting a lot of emphasis on the data and the skills and the experience required from the data scientists to extract the information out of that data. So um, we've worked over the, the, the past five years to um, have all our clinical operational data, our clinical patient data um, in a one data warehouse and to also we have access to 650 million patient lives data. That, uh, that's being used uh, for different purposes across R&D. And um, we recognize that you know, use real world data in combination most times with clinical data or even operational data, as well as, as, as um, different sources of data to um, uh, address problems, different, different kinds of uh, business problems, and specifically to R&D and um, therapies. Uh, we, have, we have a number of examples where um, we are using um, sensor data and, and uh, smart applications that uh, allow us to collect in real time passive uh, data that almost you can create a digital phenotype. And by, by using um, advanced signal processing and ML techniques, and, and we're using that information uh, to be able to assess whether our, um, if we can identify digital biomarkers to uh, understand when disease, the onset of disease, the progression of disease, and um, so and understand whether the therapy, therapies are effective. Um, we are working and proactively doing pharmacovigilance with real world data and we are in a better position to respond to safety issues. Um, we're also um, working to do comparative studies and be able to demonstrate value uh, for, for our products. And I think talking about more aspirational, you know, what we are really trying to do, and, and we have some um, proof of concept that we can use a combination of real world data and clinical data. Um, to be able to um, uh, get acceptance and approval for extensions on products that are already in the market. So one aspect that is quite interesting also uh, when, we, when we prepared for the panel, the, how do you deploy in an organization of the size of JNJ and given the diversity and multiplicity of the applications that you're trying to pursue, how do you deploy the AI infrastructure and human infrastructure in parallel with the existing infrastructure, which is essentially human curation and human study and research. Yes. And uh, how do you build those bridges? And what are some of the operational and maybe tactical challenge? Because that's probably some things that is not discussed very often, but it's probably not trivial to implement and deploy a new way maybe of thinking or doing all the things that we do as an industry and literally introduce another layer of infrastructure that is trying to do it a different way. And I'm sure there is some bridges and connection, but 
I'm curious from an operational standpoint, mm -hmm. given the size of the organization, is probably not a trivial thing. Yes, you're absolutely right. So um, AI or you know, the AI tools are creating real opportunities for pharma, but also creating real dangers if you don't have people with the skills and the domain knowledge to do the analysis. So, um, and so that's the, the one part, one end. The other end is where you actually do have um, insights that um, there's not the appropriate change management so that the insights are coming out of uh, um, AI and big data is adopted by scientists. So we are really um, looking at the starting with two ends. One is the appropriate governance and uh, so that we know the, um, the who has, and the, the strategy and the governance on um, data ownership or data accountability and having clarity on who will have access to the data, uh, who uh, qualifies to do the analysis. And we're seeing this as, as, uh, as um, an augmentation and it's being driven by the scientists. So we're not trying to convince the scientists to use the outcomes of the, of the AI and the data. We are, the scientist is part of the team. And on the other side, on the data scientist, we have hired people who are experts in both science and technology. It is very difficult skills to find, but if you do try, you, you find them. So we found uh, doctors with uh, computer science degrees. Uh, we found you know, biologists that are informaticians. So we found people who are, who are high performance computing experts who have worked in, in the field of healthcare. So looking at, so the, the, there's a language and there's a familiarity from the people who understand the technology and the people who understand the science and they can talk to each other. And the real governance on uh, how do you access the data and, and what you can do with it. By the way, uh, yesterday there was a, uh, somebody mentioned the fact that, that, that how do you get access to clinical data. I just want to say that Janssen has made all our clinical data available to researchers uh, for, to be used for um, scientific purposes. So I just want to make sure that this is, you know, that we've, uh, we're making it available. And we are, you know, participating in a number of consortia for us to have access to data as well. Uh, so change management is extremely important. And change management has to come from the scientist who is involved and we can see directly the value. The hypothesis, the questions have to start from the scientist. And the data scientist comes in as a partner to do the analytics. Okay. So Eric, you are uh, founder of a, of a smaller company that is trying to essentially uh, develop the expertise that everybody in the industry needs. and. Uh, explore new tools and new applications. So uh, tell us a little bit about the range of things you're working on, but then kind of try to then uh, guide us or talk to us about one application that you're particularly, particularly excited about that uh, might actually come into reality as we speak. Sure, great. So um, I've only been at DataVet a few months and it's my first time in a startup since 1995. And you know, my background currently is I'm, I'm at DataVant, I'm part-time at the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard, and I'm a strategic honorary advisor for innovation with Doctors Without Borders. And so I, I work in these, I split my time between these three worlds. So with respect to data, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about three things. I'm gonna talk about frog DNA, I'm gonna talk about um, the universe, and I'm gonna talk about um, cantaloupe, real quick, sorry. So what, what do you do in an NGO when you're trying to do drug discovery? Well, if you're doing a multiple drug resistant tuberculosis trial, a Russian prison may be the, most, the best clinical site you can work in. And how do you actually set that up and how do you actually do that? So that's a, that's a very big logistics problem, it's a big digital problem, it's a big data problem. Um, the, the frog DNA, one of the things that we do is a lot of people like, how do we move microbiome and all of these different things together? So there is this large data linking project and domains of data, pharma, payers, providers are pretty good at it. But the cross 
linking of data is still in its infancy. And so that's, that's, a big, that's something we really focus on. In some ways, we're going to be the middleware. So you, met, you mentioned Lipinski in the 90s. I was in a startup, and we were doing combinatorial chemistry, making lots of molecules you can screen. If you look at healthcare data, it still does look a lot like the universe. You've got these big clusters that look like planets with rings and moons around them. But then there's this vacuum of space between, even between things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, where you think things are very, very similar. Immune-mediated pathways, fibrosis, these things. And so how do you get between those, those planets? You can't paint the sky. You either need a stargate or, or something like that to do it. So that linking problem, that universe problem, is a, is a big thing. Um, the frog DNA thing is, is I try to use at least one Jaws baseball or Jurassic Park quote whenever someone gives me a microphone. Sometimes they give me a microphone twice. The frog DNA thing is in things like microbiome and stuff like that, where we're really starting out, we actually use AI to fill in the gap. So what is the function of this part of the microbiome? The same way in the first Jurassic Park movie, they said, how do you fill in the gaps in the DNA? We'll use frog DNA to do that. So in a lot of ways, I talk about AI being a bit of frog DNA with a lot of high content data. It's a good way to try to guess function and, and, and try to bring things together. The cantaloupe is actually FDA, so you're in pharma for 15 years, and then you get the job as a CIO at FDA and the first chief data scientist. So, you know, what do you do with the data? And so I'm meeting everybody, and being in pharma, I thought the FDA was the Federal Drug Administration. Well, a lot more people leave food than take drugs. The FDA actually um, regulates 24 cents on the dollar in the U.S. It's not just healthcare, but the whole food, devices, and everything like that. And so I was fascinated with how did they know in a foodborne outbreak that it was the cantaloupe from southern Colorado in seven hours. How they know that? And I got to know the people. It's like, oh, well, we've, we've sequenced all the pathogens, and we've geomapped the pathogens in the food to the different soils. And I'm like, why does it take so long to approve a drug or to find out a drug is safe? <laughs> they can do it in seven hours, right? So, so there, there's a lot, a lot of opportunity here. And what it really came down to in some ways is they're, they're doing things right. But if you look at the way math has been applied to data, especially from regulatory science. It really hasn't changed since the best um, computer we had was a slide rule. Sorry, it hasn't. It's the 50s and the 60s, so statistics. So in the 90s when I started at Pharma, nobody wanted to do rare diseases. Now everybody does rare diseases, you know, because they're giving us boundary conditions that open up to greater indications. We, we learned that they actually the tails of the data might have been more interesting than the middle of the distribution. So those are the types of problems that we're playing in, and those are the types of use cases we're working on with partners. We're going after the larger problems, the lack of middleware and linking data, and also just public health, global public health. So very quickly, uh, maybe one example of partnership to the extent that uh, either you've already entered some or you're discussing some, but uh, what would be the typical partnerships that you see coming your way right now? The, the, the two things, there's probably two most common cases being all of seven months old. One is, is we're a mid-sized healthcare system. We don't think we're doing enough with our data. And, and, and Duke is like this. Forge is, by God, tail if they're doing great things. But you know, if you look at North Carolina as an ecosystem, so you've got Duke there, you've got other schools, you've got very rural population issues, payers and stuff like that, really linking that data together to raise all boats in that health system, a lot of people are coming and says, help us, help us link our data, that's one. The other are, we're working right now with some very targeted um, what I'll call niche CRO. So for example, a CRO that specializes in things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, all the trials that never work, and says, what, what is actually an Alzheimer's patient? What is the phenotype we're even going after here? And it actually, it may not be in any of the medical records of these people. It may about be recruiting the dyad of the caregiver. Yeah. It may actually about more of the, the social determinants of health data and stuff like that. So, so thinking outside the EHR and that health isn't necessarily healthcare data, it's, it's like saying, I'm not my medical record. All right. So we're going to start with some of the, we're getting a lot of questions here. So uh, probably start with uh, Jay and Mark, because one of the questions, and not surprisingly, uh, people are looking at, uh, you know, okay, so what's concrete today? So what are a couple of tools or applications that are mostly AI supported that are concrete and that you're actually using today? So start with Jay and then I'll go to Mark. Sure, I'll give you two examples. Um, one is um, what we call generative chemistry, um, which is a suggestion box of uh, synthetic reactions uh, that as a summation event make a discrete molecule or fine tuning steps to a given molecule. Um, this seeks to harness um, the lack of bias of deep learning algorithms 
to suggest to the organic chemist a suite of reactions. Imagine you buy a drone on the internet and it says people like you bought this carrying case and these batteries and you buy both. Why does the chemist not have access to such a suggestion box? Um, fairly trivial, as it turns out, to assemble that data and to reduce it to practice, and so still it's fair to say early days. Um, a second example is virtual proof of concept. Um, we do at Novartis massive clinical trials in order to tease out um, meaningful differences, say, in cardiovascular endpoints and outcomes. Can we harness the very well-structured, very well-organized, and highly curated data sets to um, do f virtual phase one and phase two clinical trials, sometimes hypothesis testing, um, and in other cases, um, emergent properties of the data that bring hypotheses for clinical testing um, to us. Okay, Mark, uh, so, so two quick examples. One has to do with um, an emerging field called cryo-EM, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. It turns out to be really quite challenging to go from the raw data in a cryo-EM experiment to an interpretable structure where you're learning about the variability, the motion of that protein in the context of the cryo-EM experiment. There's quite a lot of math that can go into trying to do that interpretation. And if you do that the right way, you gain a much richer understanding of the mobility of the protein right out the chute. And then that enables the drug discovery team to think very differently about the problem. A second example, Coming back to the idea of what is the use of having the ability to run much longer simulations, um, what we've been able to do is take those, you know, thousandfold longer simulations and couple those with crystallographic data to build um, machine learning based models of the pre um, that predict the binding of molecules to proteins. And once those models are built, and of course they're updated every day with new information you can basically throw away about 98% of the ideas that chemists are considering making. It's not perfect, but it enables a very um, efficient triage of ideas. Um, and then those, the 2% the, the, the that remain can go into much slower, more expensive predictive models that then can be used to further narrow the, the search space. JF, if you have the appetite for one that's, I think, just about to be useful, yep. um, it has to do with um, quantifying humanity. Um, the very best drug companies make medicines that exert a positive and quantifiable impact on humanity. And we've spent so much time thinking about the medicines and actually much less time thinking about the quantification of humanity. And I hope that doesn't sound creepy to anybody, but the six minute walk test is an unacceptable measurement um, to, to assess the contribution of a medicine that would make you stronger um, or improve the quality of life of a patient with fatigue who has lupus or sickle cell disease. Um, and we've uh, taken um, the download from the consumer electronics industry that is doing a wonderful job, I think, of quantifying humanity, often with the intent of improving um, health, um, and applied it to zebrafish. You see, when we... Um, uh, uh, assess patients in the clinic as doctors, but also in clinical trials. We're using um, instruments from, in some cases, the 1920s, the Karnofsky performance status for cancer patients, the New York Heart Association heart failure classification. In the one case, how often are you on the sofa? In the other case, can you get up a flight of stairs? Critical questions, but not the rich multidimensional data that we're used to at the culmination of a drug discovery and development exercise. And so we have begin to model uh, mutations that are associated with autism spectrum disorders and other neurodegenerative diseases in zebrafish. And then we apply um, high dimensional and three dimensional video microscopy um, and then ask questions of this data. Well, you tell us, uh, deep learning, what are the behaviors of autism as learned in these zebrafish? And then apply medicines to try to correct those behaviors. In some cases, they're easily explained. The fish won't get off the bottom of the, uh, of the tank. In other cases, they're much more subtle. And so inspired by these data that we're now working with innovators at MIT, Dina Katabi, um, Barzillet, and others, um, to apply the algorithms trained in this controlled system before and after drug therapy um, to patients in chronic care facilities. I think once we have a better digital phenotyping, 
of humanity, we'll be in a better position to know um, which patients are, are most inclined to benefit from our medicines. Okay, so shifting gear a little bit here, another question, and it's going to be more for Lee and Georgia, but, uh, uh, and I think Georgia, you touched on it with the, uh, you mentioned that you're actually sharing the clinical data with, you know, researcher, but the question here has to do with uh, to what extent organizations, whether Lee, um, uh, Roche or uh, JNJ and others, uh, might be willing to share well-curated virtual control data sets that you would expect that if uh, Roche is collecting a huge amount of data and EHR and curating and coming to that characterization, actually going back to some of what Jay said of, of phenotypes and outcome, and GNG does the same thing, potentially in some of the same disease, one would hope that the data set would end up to hopefully some of the same answer or some of the same element of analysis. Uh, how do you see from an IP, from a collaboration, from a uh, you know, maybe pre-competitive standpoint, the industry starting to share standards of virtual control data sets, so for lack of a better word? So I can start. So uh, for Jensen, that's actually the way that we think. Yeah. Um, we made the decision uh, seven years ago to um, invest in external innovation. So a lot of our products you can see are uh, partnerships with other pharmaceutical companies. So we, we, claim, you know, we are proud that we know how to make uh, our partners successful as we make ourselves successful. So yes, we're actually seeking out opportunities and the pharma, company has, uh, pharma companies have waken up to the fact that there are many opportunities to collaborate in, in a non-competitive environment. And um, we, have, um, we have explored opportunities to collaborate in the way we do clinical trials and how do we evaluate the different sites and uh, how do we um, communicate and exchange uh, information with the CROs. Um, and um, we are, you know, we are actually ex exploring opportunities to share information without exposing IP. So that is actually the way we think and the way we are approaching our, our um, colleagues around in, in the whole uh, pharma uh, community. Lee? I would chime in that we also have a data sharing policy um, to further research. Um, I'm actually going to be flying from here to Honolulu to start some conversations around additional sharing of, uh, for example, imaging data that could be used with deep learning applications. And so our philosophy is truly that you know, the concept of all boats rise with the tide. We think that there's other ways that you can create competitive differentiation around your algorithms, the quality of the, the data you have on staff, the anal analysts you have on staff, the companies you partner with. And I think this is actually going to become more of the industry norm to do that sharing, that we're actually going to have to because the data is so vast. And in order to really harness it, we actually will have to have some standards, some um, ways of structuring data, of labeling data so that everyone can use it and patients ultimately get the most benefit from sharing their data. You know, one of the things that came up yesterday in one of the panels is, are patients going to start becoming more uh, aware of what's happening with their data? Mm -hmm. And I think that we as an industry are going to have to really mm -hmm. directly show them the value of giving us their data for them to be continue to be willing to do that. And we're going to have to do that together. Yeah, I just wanted to add that there are right now a number of consortia between hospitals and, and uh, pharma companies, and the pharma companies are investing in, in um, assuring that data uh, is being clean and curated and available. So um, all the participants have access to that data. And I think what we keep reminding ourselves is that it's not the data that will give you the insight. It's knowing what's the right question to ask, what's your right hypothesis, and what's the relevant data for the question you're asking. So just having data by itself doesn't necessarily give you any IP. All right, so we're, uh, we're going to run out of time quickly, so uh, we'll start in reverse order, and let's finish with like, the, the uh, proverbial aspirational question, like mm -hmm. what's, what's going to be the most exciting in each of uh, you guys' mind over the next, pick your time frame, one year, two years, 10 years, but 
what are the one thing that you're particularly excited about the entire field uh, and uh, that, you know, in some ways, in the back of your mind, you wish you could spend more time on, you know, personally. So I'll just start with Eric. Yeah, I think, I, I think I would go to the linking thing. I think I would go to the fact that with digital phenotypes, with wearables and everything like that, you know, data is being shared more, which is great, but it also almost doesn't have to be because you can reconstruct people's data pretty easily given all the public sources out there. You know, and so there's a lot that you can do to, to model and do things. So I think the ability to actually link all of a person's data together and bring their, their health care and their sick care together in a way that drives value forward um, is really the goal. Great. Georgia? I think it would, the big breakthrough for AI is going to be truly understanding disease and being able to connect everything from pharmacovigilance to discovery and having findings and safety inform a discovery and vice versa. And also finally moving into sightless clinical trials and, and being able to design the protocols up front for the value that you want to deliver rather than just designing for a label. Very good, Mark. So we, we live now in an age um, of tremendous breakthrough in structural biology. Um, it really is a golden age. And one of the things that I think will start to happen in the next few years is we'll begin to use emerging structural information to really get at some of the, the downstream challenges. And so often um, toxicology um, comes about, you know, toxic, toxicity in a molecule comes about because a molecule is being transported in some way that we didn't anticipate. It's distributing in a way we didn't like. It's being metabolized in, in an unexpected way. And there are more and more structures coming out of transporters and, and uh, metabolizing enzymes. And that information, coupled with machine learning, coupled with, you know, asking the right questions, I think is enabling us even now to start to understand the likelihood that molecules will be engaging targets we don't like. Probably the prototypical example would be the potassium channel HERG. We know that if you inhibit HERG, you can, that can cause cardiac problems. It's now possible to take the modest resolution structure of HERG that just has come out in the last year and couple that with simulation to make far more accurate predictions about HERG binding. It's not perfect, but you can see how as those structures keep coming along, and as our ability to run the simulations gets stronger and stronger, we will be able to do more with that data to predict these downstream uh, potential challenges. Lee? Aspirationally, I'd like to see a point where I, as a patient, if I discover that I have a, a malady or if there's a good likelihood that I do, that I would know what I'm going to respond to. I'm going to know what the likelihood is of, say, the combination drug that I have access to. I'm going to understand sort of my progression rates and something that would be very much about Lee, um, but something also that I could then choose to share with other patients like myself, choose to share out into the research community. Um, so something that would make that experience really, truly about that sample size of one. Very good. Last but not least, Jay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, you know, conversations like this make you so hopeful, um, but I am still so humbled by the challenges of these diseases and the inadequacy of our knowledge base and our inadequacy of our instruments to respond. I, I think there are three fundamental challenges that biomedical research faces right now, and they're big. The atomic resolution of disease, the solution set for undruggable targets, and a better quantification of humanity. And if you think deeply on each of these three vectors, as the 6,000 innovators of NIBR do every day, um, you realize that this science will be best performed at the interfaces, at the interfaces of chemistry and biology, at, and today at the interfaces of, of data science and our very best in biomedical research. So we try to tune out the white noise um, around this now, I think, logarithmic scale hype cycle of heightened expectations that we have around AI, and really dutifully identify the discrete catalysts that more <coughs> expeditiously advance us towards um, these three remaining historic challenges in, um, in therapeutic science. All right, on that note, we, uh, we, uh, I'd like Chris to note that we've saved uh, a minute and eight seconds. And uh, I'd like to thank our panelists and uh, thank you all for joining us.